a very warm warm welcome to the first tutorial on this course uh, digital signal processing and its application i am aniket sadashiv i am an undergraduate student in the department of electrical engineering iit bombay i'll be taking this tutorial in which we'll go through certain interesting problems of the weeks 4 5 and 6 uh, of this course so without further ado let's start so at first we will look at an example of using parseval's theorem to evaluate certain integrals namely the integrals which involve the sinc function for example uh, currently we will try to evaluate the integration of sin x by x whole square dx over the entire real line using parseval's theorem so let us quickly recall what parseval's theorem says says so it basically relates the two inner products in time to their inner inner products in the transform domain or the frequency domain let me call them x hat of omega and y hat of omega or if we convert the inner products to integral form we can write it like y hat of omega d omega now we will uh, use this parseval's theorem to uh, obtain the value of this integral now here i have used x but uh, hmm. so now let me take my x of t equal to y of t as sin of t by t and we know that the inverse fourier transform of sin of t by t is this rectangle function with bounds as minus 1 and 1 and uh, the amplitude as pi and this is in the omega domain or the transform domain now you can see that integrating this rectangle function is way more easier than integrating this function and that is what we are going to use so integral of sin t by t the whole square dt over the entire real line is nothing but integral of minus 1 to 1 this pi times 1 because the rectangle function is 1 in minus 1 to 1 times pi times 1 because we have two functions uh, xt and yt so both will give 1 1 rectangles and a 1 by 2 pi constant outside followed by d omega so this is nothing but 1 by 2 pi into pi square into 1 minus minus 1 which is equal to pi by 2 times 2 which is equal to pi so the value of this integral uh, is equal to pi now we'll move on to the next question so this is week 5's first problem uh, so in this we have been given a stable and a causal system with impulse response as h of n and a rational system h of z so and uh, we are given that uh, h of z has a pole at z equal to half and it also has a zero somewhere on the unit circle and Uh, about the other poles we have been given no information and we have to select the true statements amongst all these okay so from the question we can conclude that the system will have all the poles inside the unit circle because the system is stable and causal also uh, we can directly select that option a is correct why because because we have been given that there is one pole at 1 0 on the unit circle so for that zero on the unit circle we can say that uh, 
h of e to the power j omega will be zero. Now we have to conclude something related to the duration of h of n, like if h of n is finite or infinite, which we'll see how to deal with. Now before that, a quick recap on poles and zeros at infinity, like. What do we mean by a pole or zero at infinity? So this is essentially related to the degree of numerator or denominator in case of a rational function. So a rational function will have both a numerator polynomial, let me denote it by n of z, and a denominator polynomial. Now if the degree of numerator, degree of numerator n of z is greater than degree of d of z. For example, we have something like, let me use z, okay. z plus 5, z square plus 5, z plus 1 by z plus 1. Here we can see that degree of numerator is 2 and degree of denominator is 1. So for such a case, we can say that there will be a pole at infinity. Why? So let me consider a simple example. So this is the case where you will have a pole at infinity. So for example, let us take the simplest possible case, something of the form z minus 4. So one thing which is obvious is it has a 0 at 4. Now if we look at the behavior of this z minus 4 as z tends to infinity, we can say that the, this function also blows up. So, and also we know that when we encounter a pole, the value of function blows up. So in a way, this z as it tends to infinity, it behaves like a pole. So we say that it has a pole at infinity. Similarly, if the degree of numerator is less than degree of denominator, we'll have a zero at infinity. So again, we'll consider a similar example, one by z minus four. Now we can clearly see that it has a pole at four. And what happens as z tends to infinity? As z, as z tends to infinity, the this thing, the entire thing, the denominator increases and the entire thing goes to zero. So we say that this thing as z tends to behave, uh, z tends to infinity behaves like a zero. So we say that it has a zero at infinity. Okay. Now, uh, there is this claim that if, f, uh, if the sequence is a finite duration sequence, then the region of convergence is the entire z plane, except we include the possibility of z equal to zero or z equal to infinity. So let's say we have a finite duration sequence and let's say it is between two natural numbers or integers, n2 and n1. Now we can have multiple cases. So one case is your n1 is greater than zero. n1 is strictly positive. So, uh, so for xn, if we want to write the z transform, we can write it like summation x of n z to the power minus n. Now, now we know that x n1 is greater than 0. So that means that x of n will have some finite value at n1. So let us consider that point for now. We'll have other summation terms x of n1 z of minus n1 plus yeah so we have this now what will happen as z tends to 0 so for this thing you can see that as z tends to 0 this thing blows up it goes to infinity so we can say that z equal to 0 cannot be in the ROC of this case so for z equal to 0, we cannot include it in the region of convergence of this finite duration sequence in the case when n is greater than 0. So z equal to 0 is a problematic point for this sequence. Now let us consider the case where n2 is less than 0. So we have something like this, or it can be negative also, but there is some value at n2. 
that the sequence has. Now again if I write the Z transform and I only consider the point at N2, so X at N2, it will have Z to the power minus N2. Now I know that N2 is less than 0. So this negative thing will be positive. Minus N2 will be positive. Now again we can see that as Z tends to infinity, since this thing is positive, it will again blow up. So we cannot include Z tends to infinity in the region of convergence. So that is why if we have a finite duration sequence, the ROC can be the entire Z plane except z equal to 0 or z equal to infinity as we saw in these two cases. Now another interesting fact is when is the ROC the entire z plane? You can see that when n1 is greater than 0 we cannot have z equal to 0 and when n2 is when n2 is less than 0 we cannot have z equal to infinity but we want both but we want to include both of these into our ROC. So the only point at which the function can take some positive value or some value in general is at z equal to 0 and it cannot take any other value on any other points. So basically the only function or a set of functions for which the region of convergence is the entire z plane is the class of these functions where k is some constant. So for only this function since it takes value only at 0 we can say that the region of convergence is entire z plane. And for all other finite duration sequences, either you will have uh, problems at z equal to 0 or z equal to infinity or both. Okay. Now let's move back to the problem. So now what we, what we can directly conclude that h of n cannot be of finite duration because our system has a pole at z equal to half. So since it has a pole at z equal to half, but we clearly saw that for a sequence to be of finite duration, it can only have a pole at z equal to 0 or infinity. So this pole at z equal to half make, ensures that the sequence is not of finite duration, so it has to be of infinite duration. So option C has to be correct. Now let us move on to the next part. So before that again, we will quickly go through what happens when we convolve two causal sequences. So suppose xn and yn are two causal sequences. That is x of n is equal to y of n is equal to 0 for n is less than 0. Now what I am claiming is that the convolution of two causal sequences results in a causal sequence. And we can quickly see that if we just write the uh, definition of convolution xn convolved with yn is equal to this summation this is the definition of convolution now we have been given that n is less than 0 all right okay so we have n is less than 0 and we can also use the property that x of n, the value of sequence x for negative indexes k will be 0. So we can run this summation from k equal to 0 to infinity x of k y of n minus k. Because for negative k, x of k will be 0. So that will not contribute anything to the summation. Now when n is strictly less than 0, look at this term, when n is strictly less than 0 and k is greater than or equal to 0, we can see that the this entire thing n minus k, this thing will be strictly less than 0. All right. So since the argument of this thing is negative and we know that y of n is equal to 0 for negative indexes, so the entire convolution will be 0 for n less than 0. So basically the convolution of two causal sequence, when you take that, you end up with a causal sequence again. So we have been given that g of n is equal to n times h of n convolved with h of n. So since h of n was given to be causal, 
g of n will also be causal. Now, if we quickly move back to the question, we want to conclude about the stability of the system G. All right. So, before that, let us look at uh, the how we are going to obtain the Z transform of G. So, we know that H of n convolved with H of n using the properties of Z transform is nothing but H of Z square because convolution in time domain results into product in the z domain. Also, g of n is n times this function, h of n convolved with h of n. Now, we know that if we multiply a sequence by n, and if we take the z transform, then it becomes this. So, this is basically the multiplication of n in time domain results in this operation in the z domain. So we can quickly obtain the z transform of g. So let me denote it by capital G of z, which is equal to minus z times derivative of h of z square, which is equal to minus z into 2 h of z times derivative of so this will be the z transform of g. Now, since we know that h of z is, is stable, all the poles will lie. Let me change colors. All the poles will lie inside the unit circle. Or in, in another way, we know that uh, outside the unit circle, the system will converge or the Z-transform will exist. Now, what about the derivative of H of Z? Okay, so we need to focus on this term. So this term is stable, so it will not cause any issues. And again, this only contributes a zero. So this will again not affect stability because it is not contributing poles. So the only problematic term left now is derivative of H of Z. So we need to deal with this. Now, we know that the, the region of convergence of the derivative of a function for a rational function. Now, here we will use the fact that h of z is rational. Okay? We will see why, uh, the, what happens when h of z is irrational. We cannot conclude that the region of convergence remains the same. But in case of rational systems, the region of convergence of ROC, the ROC, ROC of h of z is the same as the uh, region of convergence of h of z except inclusion or exclude except the uh, at the point uh, z equal to 0 apart from that the region of convergence remains the same for both and anyways z equal to 0 is not going to affect our stability because even if there are some issues at z equal to 0 we have a we, it, it will still be inside the unit circle. So, it will not affect the stability as long as all the poles are inside the unit circle. So, yeah, so we can claim that G of Z is stable because all these three terms will have poles inside the unit circle. Basically, they all converge outside the unit circle. The region of convergence is greater than the unit circle. So, G of Z is stable. And hence we can mark option D as correct. So option D is also correct. Okay. Now we can move on. Okay. Th there's one more thing. So I use this fact that the region of convergence is the same after differentiation. Now I can only use this fact when my system is a rational function. For a rational function, this thing holds. This claim is correct. It's not exactly the same. You, we need to still check at the, the behavior of the function at zero. But, but for most of the cases, ROC will still remain the same after differentiation. Now, what will happen in case of irrational function? You can see that this uh, claim will not be true. And I have uh, referred a link below. You can go and check it out. They have given an example uh, in which the region of convergence of the derivative of z transform is different from the region of convergence of z uh, of the function 
and uh, the for the sake of time we are skipping that but you can go over it for a quick read all right so okay next we consider another problem in which we have to deal with the existence of z transform of the sinc function so here i have defined sinc function as sin of n pi by 2 over n pi by 2 and we have to conclude something regarding the existence of z transform over all z over the unit circle uh, if its region of convergence is greater than 1 or if it is less than 1 okay so let's quickly go over it so i have just defined the sinc function here it is sin n pi by 2 over n pi by 2 it's equal to 1 when n is equal to 0 by definition for all even multiples uh, for all even integers this 2 and 2 will get cancelled so we'll have sin m pi on the numerator which is 0 and for all odd integers we know that sin of 2m plus 1 by 2 pi is equal to minus 1 to the power m so using that we get this expression all right now the next thing that we need to recall is when does the z transform exist or here existence by existence we mean when does the z transform converge so we are basically concerned with what is the region of convergence of our the z transform of the function now <coughs> in the theory lectures we have seen that this z transform of the function converges when our sequence at that point let's say here there should have been a z this thing is absolutely summable so for all such z for which this summation comes out to be finite or less than infinity we can say that the z transform exists at that point so we'll plug in different let's say if i want to check if my z transform converges at z equal to 2 so i'll put in z equal to 2 i'll evaluate this summation and on the basis of that if it converges then i'll say that the z transform exists at that point or if it diverges then we'll say that the z transform does not converge now let us first look at the convergence at mod z equal to 1 so <clears throat> at mod z equal to 1 i'll quickly write the terms involved in the z transform so summation n equal to minus infinity to infinity let me denote sinc of n by 2 as x of n x of n into now i am taking mod z equal to 1 so this thing will go off since mod z is equal to 1 which is equal to mod of x n now we know we know that we know the value of functions at certain point so let me break this summation for the cases where n is odd and n is even and n is 0 so for n is equal to 0 we have 1 plus for n belonging to even numbers we'll have 0 and for n is equal to odd let's say we'll have terms of the form 0 0.55 times 2m minus 1 so here i am claiming that n is equal to 2m minus 1 and your m will range over all integers so we will get this summation so the scripted z denotes the set of all integers now we can see that by symmetry in this term over the i'll have an absolute sign as well over the negative terms as well as positive terms the value remains the same for example when consider the case where m is equal to 1 and let's say m is equal to 0 so when m is equal to 1 this term becomes minus 1 to the power m will go up because of this absolute sign so we need not be concerned with this so this term will be 0 0.5 pi times 1 over 1 and for m is equal to 0 this term will be 1 by 0 0.5 times 2 into 0 minus 1 
but this absolute sign will remove this minus 1 so this will again become 1 by 0 0.5 by times 1 so by symmetry we can see that uh, these two uh, terms will be like for every plus 1 for every positive odd integer we will also have a corresponding negative odd integer in this summation so I can just sum over the positive integers and multiply my summation by 2. Also I am taking this 0 0.5 pi as 1 by 2 so I will have a 4 by pi here. 2 comes, so this is 2 into 2, 2 for the removal of the negative half and 2 from this 0 0.5 pi and this is 1 by 2 m minus 1. So this is what my summation turns out to be. Now this thing, this thing what I am claiming is this thing will diverge. So this is nothing but 1 by 1 plus 1 by 3 plus 1 by 5 till infinity and this thing diverges. So this is something that we know by properties of sequences. So this thing is a divergent sequence. So clearly since our sequence does not converge, so our Z transform does not exist at Z equal to 1. So we can rule out the, so this option is ruled out since our Z transform does not exist for Z equal to 1 so clearly it does not exist for all Z and it clearly does not exist for Z equal to 1 as we saw right now. Now let us look at for what happens for other Z which is not equal to 1. Again I can expand my Z transform as this. So I can take the summation from minus infinity to 1 and from 0 to infinity. Now there can be two cases. One is when mod of z is greater than 1. So let me take this case first. So when mod of z is greater than 1, you can see that this thing will diverge. Because n is negative, so this thing will be positive. So as this n tends to infinity, this term will diverge the first term. Now for the second case when mod of z is less than 1 you can see that this term will diverge because these will be terms of the form 1 by z to the power n and your mod of z modulus of z is less than 1. So when your modulus of z is less than 1 uh, as you move towards n equal to 0 this thing will again tend to infinity so because of that this term will diverge because of this z to the power so in either case we can see that our summation diverges so we can say that for z not equal to 1 also uh, we also we don't have so this is also false this is also false uh, I'm sorry, uh, it says does not exist, so yes, so it does not exist on the unit circle, it does not exist for z greater than or equal to 1, it does not exist for z less than 1. So option A is correct because it says does not exist. So yeah, so we'll look at some more problems in the next lecture, so stay tuned till then. Thank you.